Hello, hello, what's up everybody? <clears throat> hey, those of y'all on the floor, there are like dozens of empty seats back here. There's lots. Unless you love the floor. All right. Hey, y'all good? Happy 4th. It's going to be awesome. We have fireworks tonight. It's going to be wonderful. All right, uh, grab a Bible and let's go to Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, and uh, you know, this week, obviously we've been talking about the Father heart of God all week, and so, man, uh, we've talked about, you know, I know Brody talked about the discipline of the Lord, like God is Father and how He disciplines those that He loves, and His general discipline, we've talked about how God um, is speaking to His Son, how He's present, um, we talked about God as a, as a Father and God as a King. And so this morning, continuing on the focus of uh, the Father heart of God, we're, this passage in Matthew 7, we're going to look at, you can trust God. You can trust God as Father. Because again, we know, we recognize that a lot of you have earthly dads that you may or may not be able to trust. And this is one of those passages in Scripture that when I was y'all's age, well, when I was y'all's age, I was not a believer. Um, I became a believer right after high school, right before college. And this is one of those passages that would trip me up because I'd be like, this isn't true, but it is. I just wasn't sharp enough to catch what he was, what he was saying. So Matthew chapter 7, uh, just to give some context, this part of the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, it helps us to understand who Jesus is talking to here. So he's probably talking to a giant crowd of people, but within that giant crowd of people, he's directing a lot of this message towards his disciples, towards those that are believers, those guys that are close to him, those guys that are following him. And so you could say this is directed mostly to Christians. Um, and so <clears throat> that'll help us kind of interpret this passage a bit. So Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Again, this is one of those passages that I was like, uh, before I knew Christ. So listen to what it says, starting in verse 7 of Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, will find. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. When I was in high school, I'd read that passage and be like, nah. Why? I mean, because you read this passage at first, and it's like, anything you ask for, God's going to give it to you. It sounds like genie, right? All right, grant me some wishes. I, it just said... Everybody who asks receives. That does sound genie-tastic, like anything you ask for, you're going to get. Is that what he's saying? No. Everybody's saying no because why? Because you've asked for stuff you haven't gotten before, right? We can do it right now. Lord, please make money appear right here. Didn't happen. So obviously he's not saying whatever you ask for at any time, just ask and it's going to happen for you. Because that would be getting things backwards, right? If you could tell God, hey, make this happen, and God would be like, yes, sir, Woo, that would be wrong. God doesn't have to obey any man, right? Or any woman. And so it's not like God can be commanded, do this, do that. Now, there is a false teaching that's out there, and y'all need to watch out for it. There's a false teaching that says, if you ask for anything and have enough faith, God must obey you. God must do what you ask. There is no God must category. Like God does not have to do what we ask. So what is he saying here? Obviously this is going past like, uh, you know, whatever you ask for. But so what, what exactly is he saying? I think what he's setting up is he's showing us that we can trust him. And so he'll, the next few verses, which I didn't read when I was in high school, I stopped short at those verses. The next few verses help to, uh, help to explain what he's talking about. So he says, everybody who asks receives, and to the one who seeks, he'll find. The one who knocks, it'll be open to him. And now he's going to start explaining it, because everybody immediately would be like, mm. verse 9. Or which one of you, if his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent? All right, so this has to be a strange illustration for these guys. Remember, they're gathered around Jesus on a hill. And so he's talking to his disciples. Some of them are dads, right? Probably a lot of them are dads. And so he's using a good illustration. He says, hey, you can ask me for anything. Everybody who asks receives. So in case everybody's like, oh, I don't know. 
he says, okay, which one of you, dads? If your son says, daddy, I'm hungry, can I have some bread? Which one of you would be like, no, nah, here's some gravel. You can eat on that. Just chew on that for a little while. Or which one of you, if your son's like, daddy, can I have a piece of fish? I'm so hungry. would be like, no, but here's a poisonous snake. Try to eat that. And all the disciples would be like, who would do that? No, nobody would do that. Now, there are some dads in the world that are terrible and would do stuff like that. But Jesus is saying, generally, dads know you generally, you give good stuff to your kids, right? Now, some dads don't do a great job with this, but even the worst dads generally, now this is not everybody, but generally, everybody knows if your kid's hungry, you give them food. You, you generally, dads take care of their kids. He's appealing to this kind of universal rule, dads take care of their kids. Now, some dads don't. But most dads give good things to their kids. So he's saying, which one of you, if your kid asked for a good thing, would give them a bad thing? And they're all like, yeah, yeah, nobody would do that. And I think you could argue the, the opposite as well. Like, which one of you, if your kid asked for a bad thing, would actually give it to them? Right? Because dads try to protect their kids. So I told you I got four kids. I've got three biological kids. And I told y'all that uh, I, we got this one kid. He's been living with us for five months or so, uh, and we're working on adopting him. He's a foster kid. He's a really cool kid. He's about six. He is six. He's not about six. Uh, he's six, and uh, he's super, super country, like real country, and so, you know, we get this kid, and he's six, and what's funny is that we don't know what he likes or doesn't like at first or what he can or can't do, and so we went, um, y'all's town have something like Wing Wednesday. You know, you got this we, we have a place in the next town where on Wednesdays you get wings for like 50 cents or whatever. And they have, you know, every wing place has your normal flavors like teriyaki and mild, medium, and hot. And then some places have this like stupid category, this like death wish or like dragon sweat. You know, I don't know what they call it, but like there's this, don't, no, nobody gets that, but as a joke, you know. And so I take the all four kids. I take them to, uh, to this Wing Wednesday, and they had been the week before with my wife. My wife is the one that sang last night uh, for, for the girls' night. Um, guys, you don't know. Uh, but so I take, I take these guys out to Wing Wednesday, and I have no clue what this kid likes or if he likes hot stuff or, he, or if he doesn't, you know? And so we're out there, and I'm like, all right, what y'all want? What y'all want to eat? And my oldest daughter says, I like six teriyaki wings. And I'm like, great, sounds good. I go to my other daughter, and I say, what, what do you want? She said, I want six medium wings. I'm like, great. I go to my son. I'm like, what you want? He said, I want 10 hot wings. And I'm like, great. And I turn to this kid and I say, what you want, buddy? And he goes, um, how about 20 dragon sweat? You know, or whatever it was. And I was like, I look over my other kid because they've been there the week before. And they're all like. <laughs> and so I'm trying. No, I don't know if he really likes hot stuff or whatever. And so I'm like, man, you sure? You sure about that? And my daughter leans over and says, he got medium last week and cried. And I was like, all right, all right. How about mild, man? How about, and he's like, no, I think I want the drag and sweat or whatever it was. And I was like, I, we're going to go with mild. And he was like, mm. so finally, you know, the wings came out and everybody's tasting them. And I watch him and he's getting that mild wing. He takes one bite into it and goes, hey, hey, like this. I'm like, I knew it. I knew it. And so, you know, because He's asking for something bad. I'm not, I'm not going to give it to him. Uh, one, one other quick story. We didn't know he, okay, so we go to a pool, and we're like, hey, man, you can swim, right? And, you know, and he's like, oh, yeah. And uh, so we're like, great, great, great. Hop in. And he goes, bloop, 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 straight to the bottom. And I said, Amy, grab him, grab him, grab him. And she pulls him up, and he does that one, like, burp slash throw up. And he's like, All, like, tons of water come up. And we're like, all right, can't swim. We know, we know that now. So we go out to the lake the other day, and there's this big, like a really tall dock that you can jump off of. And he gets up on top of there. He's got his life jacket on. He goes, hey, can I take my life jacket off? And I'm like, heck no. He, we would never see him again. He'd just be like, blah, 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 all the way to the bottom. So like, even bad dads know, if your kid asks for something that's going to hurt him, you swap that out. You know, can I drown? No, not today. Can can I burn my insides out? Not, no, not today. So Jesus is appealing to this universal rule. Generally, dads take care of their kids, right? Generally. And so one problem you could have with this passage is like, okay, so 
God's not going to give you anything you want. Great. God's not going to give you something bad if you ask for it. But one problem you might have is like, but what, what about good things that I ask for that I don't get? What about things that have to be good and in line with God's will? Like, hey, why don't you, God, can you please heal my mom? Can you please alleviate this suffering? Can you please stop this situation that hurts? What about those situations that seem like this can only be good? Please help me in this situation. What about when God doesn't answer that? Because here in this passage, he says, everybody who asks receives. So our, our options are, if we ask for something good and he doesn't answer, we kind of have three options. Either, number one, God doesn't really exist. If, he, if we ask for good things and he's promised to give us good things and he doesn't give us good things, then option one is maybe he doesn't exist. And our prayers are just floating out there somewhere. Now we know that's not true. So option two is he exists, but he's a bad father. He wants us to suffer or he just can't do anything about it. Or our third option is he's a good father and there's an explanation for why he doesn't answer when we ask for good things. And that's the point of this passage, really. He's saying, when you ask for good things, when a son asks, he's saying, ask me for anything and I'm going to answer. Even y'all know, even dads know, if your son asks for something good, you don't give him something bad. That's the point of this passage is he's saying, you can trust me as a father. He goes on to explain it in verse 11. And, I, and I'm, I've prayed that y'all will get this verse because I think it's really key to understand it. Verse 11, if you then, pause before I read this verse, you remember who he's talking to? The disciples, right? And a larger crowd, mostly believers. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? All right, hold up. He is calling his disciples evil. If you, disciples, you expect him, because these guys are following him, they're close to him, you expect him to say something like, all right, if you guys that are human know how to give good gifts, how much more do I know how to, give, how to give good gifts? That's not what he says. If you who are less than perfect, he says, if you who are evil, you think he is lumping them in with evil, evil men, right? So one thing that he's pointing out, and I want to pause here, and I need you to listen real careful, especially, uh, you know, I don't know what your family situation is like, but I need you to listen carefully to this. One thing I think he's doing is he's lumping in all dads as evil. And I'm not trying to minimize if you had a good dad or if you had a bad dad. I'm not trying to minimize the impact that they had on your life. Because a bad dad can be devastating. A good dad can be such an advantage. But I think what he's saying here, and Jesus is not trying to minimize the situation here. But I think what he's saying is there's not that much difference between good and bad earthly dads. Pause, I need you to hear me. Some of y'all are like, heck no, absolutely not. My dad was abusive. I've prayed that this illustration would make sense because it's such a heavy topic. I'm gonna use a basketball illustration, which seems out of place here, but I'm praying that it makes sense to talk about the difference between good earthly dads and bad earthly dads and God as a father. All right, y'all with me? All right, so there's this kid who plays basketball, his name's Zion Williamson. Maybe you've heard of him, he's super, super good. So uh, he, you know, what, two years ago was in high school and was just unreal. He's from South Carolina, he's six foot seven. He is just a freak of nature, just an athletic monster. He dunks on everybody. And everybody, when he was in high school, his, his high school tapes went really viral, you know, and, and everybody was like, yeah, but how is he gonna do in college, you know? And so he went to Duke last year and dunked on everybody. Like, he was so dominant in college that he just, you know, they just had the NBA draft and he was the first pick in the NBA draft. He's just an incredible, incredible athlete. Well, when he was at Duke, he set the all-time school record for vertical jump. Y'all get what I'm saying? Like, for vertical jump, all-time school record. And the way they measure that is they take a guy and he can have a run-up he runs up and takes a two-foot jump, and they got this pole that goes out like this with little flags on it. And when you jump, you tap these flags, and however many you spin, basically, that tells you how high your vertical is. So he does it the first time and hits all of them. Whap! And everybody's like, 
Oh my gosh. And so they take weights and stack them underneath this thing, and he just keeps hitting all of them. And so he breaks the school record. So I want y'all to watch. There's like a 10-second video of Zion Williamson breaking the Duke uh, vertical jump record. Watch this video, and then we'll keep explaining. Come on, Zion, bro. Let's go. Let's go. All right, so Zion Williamson, this is his vertical jump. His feet, bottom of his feet, oh, are 40 inches off the ground. So the bottom of his shoes are right here, which is insane. If you think about it, that, that is a huge 40-inch vertical, all right? That's especially big when you think about how high the average man can jump. <laughs> Your average guy can jump 20 inches. That's a huge difference. Especially when you consider that Zion Williamson is six foot seven and your average man is not. If you think about it, Zion has an 82 inch wingspan. So with his arm up, his six foot seven frame and his 40 inch vertical, his, the top of his fingers are 13 and a half feet. You think if you try to take a shot on somebody whose fingers are 13, it's like 13 four, 13 uh, feet, four inches off the ground, you're getting blocked every time. You're gonna die, really. Hey, if he tries to dunk on you, 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 you just died, right? If your five foot 10 self jumps this high off the ground against a guy who's six, seven and jumps that high off the ground, there is a devastating difference. Uh, like to the rim on the court, there is a huge, huge game change in a difference between Zion's vertical and yours. You see where I'm going with this? On earth, there is a devastating difference between a good dad and a bad dad. It makes a huge difference. It makes all the difference in the world. You feel that weight every day. There is a huge, huge difference a devastating difference on earth between a good dad and a bad dad. What God's saying, without minimizing that, is he's saying he is so far removed from all dads. So there's a devastating difference between Zion's vertical and your vertical to the rim. But let's say the goal wasn't to the rim. Let's say it was to the moon. Let's look at this picture. Distance between the earth and the moon there. Let's say your goal wasn't to dunk it. Your goal was to touch the moon. Is there a big difference now between Zion's vertical and your vertical? Not really. Let's say his hand's here and yours is here. Who cares? Neither one of y'all is touching the moon. Even if we said touch the ceiling. There's, to the rim, there's a huge difference. To the moon, there's not. And what God's saying is, compared to him, all earthly dads are evil. Yeah, there's a devastating difference on earth, but compared to him, all earthly dads there's not that much of a gap between all earthly dads compared to the gap between earthly dads and him. I hope that makes sense because what he's saying is if you dads who all are lumped as evil, if you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more me who's way over here, God who's so far removed from all dads, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more your father, will your father in heaven give good gifts to his kids? to those who ask him. So if your dad was a good dad or your dad was bad or somewhere in between, take heart because God is the real good father. All others in comparison are evil. And the best good gifts that an earthly dad gives, God can give better. <clears throat> There's a verse in Isaiah 40. You don't have to look it up. It says something similar. It says, but Zion said, different Zion, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. And then the answer that God gives is, basically, how can I forget you? He says, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? The, the, uh, it says, Zion said, God's forgotten me. And God's like, man, a, a nursing, uh, a mother can't, can't forget her nursing child, her infant. He says, can, can, a, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? 
Even these may forget, but I won't forget you. He says, unlikely that a, that a mother would forget her infant, but it's impossible that I would forget you. All right, so back to the question. Why doesn't God, he's good, he's so far removed from earthly dads, why doesn't God answer our prayers for things that have to be good, things that are unselfish, right? Let me give two thoughts on that, and, and they're illustrations off my kids, but here, here's the thing. The, the first one is, my kids ask for things all the time that they think have to be good, but they don't understand the ripple effects out a couple times. So my kids, y'all's Walmart, I, I know at all, our Walmart, they sell no, they give away puppies like every day. Y'all, y'all not do that? Okay, I don't know what the phenomenon is here, but like there, there's always a pickup truck with free puppies out at Walmart. And so every time we go to Walmart, what do my kids say? Can we get a puppy? No. Now, why do I say no? Because I hate puppies. No, I don't hate puppies. I'm just kidding. I love puppies, right? Who wouldn't love a puppy? They are cute and fluffy and they fall a lot, it's great. Like, puppies are awesome, right? So when my kids ask, can we get a puppy? They're thinking, this is only good. But what am I thinking? Oh, well, it won't be a puppy for long. And our last puppy, you don't care about. You don't pay any attention to him. And so then you'll have to get another puppy. And then you won't pay attention to him. And then another puppy. And then they can't understand, like, he doesn't say a puppy for long. Or another illustration, when we go through the, the checkout line at the grocery store, pause, you should know something about me. I do not like many sweets. I don't like cookies. I don't like cake. I'm not big on ice cream. Listen, listen, everybody is their own man. All right, but you know what I do like? Cheap, trashy gas station candy. I mean, if you've ever wondered, who buys that? Who buys circus peanuts? Cherry sours? Who buys that mess? Hello. It's me. I buy that mess, and it is so good. So, like, for me, I love, in fact, at my desk at home right now, I got rainbow bacon. You know, you know what that is? The sour strips of, looks like bacon. Uh, so, when, my, when we go through the grocery aisle, my kids say, uh, when we go through the checkout, what's there? just cheap candy. And my kids say, hey, can we have some candy? And I say, no. Now, I love candy more than the next guy. But I know that that will start a pattern to where every time we come to the grocery store, they'll be like, hey, can I have candy? Can I have candy? Can I have candy? And then they'll start equating grocery store with unhealthy food, and they'll start building in these unhealthy habits. So I'm looking, they're looking candy equals good. I'm looking about three steps out and saying, that's probably not good. So what I'm saying is sometimes when we ask for something that we're like, this has to be good, God might be looking and seeing three steps out where this, this is not going to be good for them. That's the first alternative. The second one is <clears throat> sometimes when we ask for something that seems to be only good, God tells us no for reasons we can't grasp. We couldn't get it. Sometimes my kids ask me for things like, hey, can I go spend the night at this person's house? And I'll say no. And it'll be because of reasons they can't grasp yet. Because I know the dad has a problem with porn. Something that's really deep, some, some larger reason that I couldn't even begin to explain to my kids. And so I'll say no, and they'll say, why not? And I'll say, you're going to have to trust me on that one. You can't carry that yet. You're not ready for that answer yet. But you're going to have to trust me. And I think that's what God is saying in these verses is, you ask and I'll give it to you. If earthly dads who I'm so much better than, if they know how to give good gifts to their kids, you gotta trust me when I, when I say, I'm only gonna give you, only gonna give you what's good. So <clears throat> you, if you think about it, what God's saying is, whatever you, he's not saying, whatever you ask for, I'll give you. He's saying, when you ask, I will give you what's best. He's not saying, ask and I'll give you whatever you want. He's saying, ask and I'll give you what's best. Even if you ask for something bad, he's going to give you something good. If you ask for something good, he's going to give you something better. And that doesn't mean things. Most times that means himself. The good gift that God gives is himself. But if you think that God is in control of all things and he's promising, <clears throat> I'm going to take care of you. I'm only going to give you good things even when you ask for bad things. I'm a good dad. If you put those two things together, God is all powerful and all good and working for us. It really leaves no room for anxiety. 
It leaves no room for freaking out. God is going to answer our prayers for good if we're his. So why do we struggle with prayer so much? Because if I were to go around and say, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Most of us would be like, nah, great. Because a lot of us don't have problems praying when we're in trouble. When, when the stress comes, when somebody gets sick, but on a day-to-day, we're like, uh, I just kind of don't think about it. But you think about what God's promised. God is all powerful, all good, all wise, and will give us better than what we ask if you pray. And a lot of us are like, no, nah, no thanks. For real? I mean, think about the promises about prayer. Uh, th- there's a quote from a guy named Spurgeon. He says this, if you may have everything by asking in his name and nothing without asking, I beg you to see how vital prayer is. John Piper said, God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five hours or five months or five years. This is one reason the habit of prayer is wise. God can do more in five seconds than you can do in five years. That's a huge thought. You remember Paul and Silas when they're in jail that one time? They start praying and singing. It's in Acts. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, all the doors were opened. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now, I'm not saying that these guys were praying to be released from jail, but imagine how long it would have taken them to, to have broken out of jail to actually get out of the bonds, to get out of the doors, to get past the jailers. It could have taken them five years to do that. And God did more in five seconds than they could do in five years. It's crazy. How much good are we missing out on by not praying? God is a good daddy and will give us what's best. So go back to the first part of the verse. Seeing that God's so far removed from earthly dads, he'll only give us what's best. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. He's saying, man, please ask me for stuff, please. And it's a progression. Ask, and don't just ask, but keep on asking. And don't just keep on asking, but look for me. And don't just look, but knock. Man, my kids do this, right? If I'm downstairs and they're upstairs, I'll hear this, daddy, way far away. And I never think, that's over. I know, they're like a heat-seeking missile, right? They're going to be like, daddy, 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 until they find, if I'm in the bathroom with the door shut, Daddy! Daddy! I'll be like, oh my gosh. They're going to find me, right? So this isn't saying, man, God is locked away somewhere and he's inaccessible. This is saying, you've got the closeness of relationship. We just don't ask. We, we're like, Daddy? Oh, well. We just stop. But you got the closeness of relationship. You think about when I'm in my office downstairs studying, if somebody I don't know well wants to get my attention in my office, what do they do? They come up to my door and they, I'm like, hey, oh, so sorry to bother you. I don't mean to interrupt. I just got a quick question. Is that cool? That's somebody I don't know well. My friends are like, hey, right? Because I got there in my kids. I can hear them coming around the porch. And I'm, it doesn't matter who I'm with. And somebody can be crying in my office and they're like, boom, 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 blam. Daddy, hey, guess what? And just start into their thing, you know? Because they've got this, we got this close relationship where I'm not going to be like, no, get out. Because in reality, I like them better than whoever I'm meeting with. True story. So they know that I have this close relationship with them. You don't, you don't treat a stranger like that. You treat a friend like that. And, you know, in Luke, when it gives us this thing about ask and it'll, it'll be given to you, it precedes it with a story about a man who at midnight, he's got a guy that drops into his house and he's like, oh, great, friend's over. Oh, shoot, I don't have any food. So he goes over to his neighbor, who apparently he's great friends with at midnight. He goes over to his neighbor's house and he's like, hey, man, hey, I got some friends over. Hey, wake up, I need some food. And his friend's like, just rolls over and he's like, hey, food, hey, wake up. I know you're in there. And the guy finally yells from his bed and he's like, I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. Go away. And he's like, nope, nope, not going away. Who do you treat like that? Your friends, (laughs) right? You don't treat a stranger like that. And God here is saying, you need to ask and then look and then knock. Because we have that closeness of relationship, you can trust me. But here's the thing. We don't ask. We don't talk to God in prayer. And here's the difference. 
my kids ask me for a lot of things and I reach a point where I'm like, I'm done. You know, there's an Australian study that kids ask on average 288 questions per day, which peaks at four years old where they ask 390 questions per day. You think about how much they're awake and how much they're asleep and how much they play by themselves. You're looking at over a question a minute. Depending on how much they play by themselves, you're looking at two to three questions a minute. Hey, daddy, can we do this? Hey, daddy, hey, daddy, hey, daddy, hey, daddy, which is great for a few hours. And then at some point you reach a limit where you're like, no more. I need five minutes when nobody asks me for anything. Just give me a second. That was 388 questions, rapid fire. But the thing is, the difference between evil earthly dads like myself and God is that God never is like done with our requests. In fact, he's commanding you, you need to ask me for more. You need to ask for more. Because of the closeness of this relationship, his, because he's such a good father, not only is he going to give us better than what we ask for, but he's saying, you don't ask enough. You need to ask and I'll give it to you. You can trust me. You can trust me. It will be given. It will be opened. Last thought. If at this point in the sermon you're like, all right, so what you're saying is I can trust God because he said you can trust me? <laughs> like, who do you do that with? That's like sketchy 101. You know if somebody says, you can trust me, you'd be like, no, I can't. <laughs> right? Oh, why didn't you say so? If you told me I could trust you, let's go. You know, like, you got to think, talk's cheap. What has God done to where I can trust him? Here's the thing. No matter how bad the world is, God has already proven himself. God has already given us the greatest good. Romans 8, 32. This verse is crucial. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? How has God already proven that we can trust him? He's given us Jesus. He's given us himself, all of himself. We can trust him with smaller things. He's given us himself. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What has God done to, to earn your trust? He's given us Jesus, and he's given us the right to become his children. He's made us his kids. He's adopted us. Ezekiel 36 talks about what he's going to do inside of us. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He's given us a new nature. So when God says, you can trust me, I'm a good daddy. You can ask me for more and I'll only give you what's good. You can trust me. And we think, how can I trust him? He's already given us himself. He's already, if you're a Christian, given us adoption as his kids. He's already given us his nature inside of us to make us new. He's given us himself, made us his children, given us a new nature. And he'll only give us good things if we ask. And he tells us, ask, ask for more. These things demonstrate the Father heart of God, and we can trust him. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks for these guys and girls. And this week, I thank you that we can trust you, that you're a good father. Lord, since you say, ask and it'll be given, I pray that they're, uh, if there are non-believers in the room, that they'll become believers. I pray that if there are weak Christians in the room, that we will become strong. I pray you'd help us to fight sin. I pray that you'd draw, draw us closer to you. I pray that you prepare us to hear from the, the breakouts that are fixing to happen. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.